All right, let's get started. Welcome everyone, I'm Jag. I'm a software engineer here at Instagram, and today's talk is about concurrency. It doesn't have to be hard when you're using Kotlin coroutines and channels. So we all started off with things like this, async task and loaders. And these were great APIs at the time because it was really easy for us to go from the background thread back to the UI thread. But over the years, we started to realize that you know, there's some issues with this. So we started to go back to using Java threads, and we paired that with things like executors and thread pools because we knew that threads were expensive. But that meant that we had to introduce a lot more callbacks into our code. So now our code started to get littered with a lot of these callbacks. But on top of that, when it came to communicating between different threads, it also meant that we had to introduce things like synchronization primitives. So now our code started to get harder to reason about, and it was even harder for us to test that code. Now, that meant that we're spending a lot more time trying to, trying to satisfy the computer than we were actually trying to solve the problem that we set out to solve. So then we got introduced to something called futures. Now, this was a nice little evolutionary step to what we had before because it allowed us to wrap these big blocks of async code into something that was more functional. And that allowed us to then compose on top of that and, and create more complex operations. But if you really think about it, we were kind of massaging the problem. We weren't really tackling the root cause of the problem. And then we got RxJava. So this was kind of like the game changer moment, right? Like this is where we start to really address this whole issue of async and concurrent programming from a completely different lens. And we got these, we started building our systems to be more reactive. So parts of our app was emitting events and then other parts of our app was reacting to these events. And on top of that, RxJava was giving us this really powerful suite of operators so that with just a couple lines of code, we can write some really powerful functions. And, and you know, this meant that we're developing in a more functional reactive, in a functional more reactive manner. So the point is that over the years, we've accumulated all these different ways of tackling this whole space. And it's, it's really hard, right? And Kotlin comes up with another way. It's called coroutines and channels. And, and really, it's part of this broader topic known as communicating sequential processes, or CSP. Nothing new, it's been around for a while, uh, since the late 70s, a number of languages have adopted this. And what I wanted to do today was really go into the fundamentals of, of using coroutines and channels. And the way I want to do that is by using this analogy of a coffee shop. And we're gonna work through a couple of examples here. I'm gonna keep these examples pinned here so they're, they're fully interactive. Feel free to check them out. You can run them, modify them. So try them out. I'll keep them pinned here in the top corner of the presentation. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna build on top of this coffee shop and, and make it more scalable and, and see how we can leverage coroutines and channels to get there. So let me go back to this analogy here and let me walk through how this first version works. So it's a very simple coffee shop. It's just got one barista that's operating this coffee shop and it only makes cappuccinos. And now let's assume that a customer comes in, places an order, this barista takes that order, walks over to the coffee grinder, grinds those coffee beans, takes those ground beans over to the espresso machine, pulls that espresso shot, and now puts that aside for a second, goes ahead and steams the milk, and then takes the two, the espresso shot and the steamed milk, combines the two to create a cappuccino. So if we were to go ahead and implement this in our code, let's take a look at how we would do that. So now all these examples are going to use the same set of uh, orders. So let me just go through this once and we can kind of set that aside and not really have to worry about it. So each order item contains two things, the type of coffee beans and the type of milk that we'll use. And together, these two items come up with a certain price associated with it. So let's go ahead and just collapse that. But let's focus on how we would implement this first version. So we're going to iterate through this list of orders. And for each order item, we're going to call this function to grind the coffee beans. And we get back this ground beans object. And then we go ahead and call this pull espresso shot function. We get back the espresso shot. We call a steam milk, we'll get back the steamed milk object. And then finally, we'll take those two objects, we'll pass it into this make cappuccino function, which comes back, gives us a cappuccino object. And then finally, we'll log that to the console. Now we wanna do one more thing. We wanna measure how long it's taking to process all these orders. So we're gonna wrap it with this measure time millis block and we'll log that to the console as well. So now before I run this example, let's just quickly go through what each of these functions is going to do. And really what we're trying to do here is just simulate some long running operation. So let's just say that each function here is gonna just call the thread to sleep for some period of time. So grinding the coffee beans will cause the thread to sleep for a second. And then pulling the espresso shot will sleep for 600 milliseconds. 
steaming the milk will take 300 milliseconds. And then finally, maybe we want to do some fancy latte art. We'll say that it takes 100 milliseconds to make the cappuccino. So our application looks something like this. Let's go ahead and run it, and we'll see how our first version is working. So it's pretty straightforward. The first thing we're going to do here is just log out the list of orders. And then the burst is going to go ahead and grind the coffee beans, pull the espresso shot, steam the milk, make the cappuccino, and then finally log that cappuccino object out to the console. And this is going to happen for all the orders. And the barista is going to do this all sequentially. In other words, the, the barista can't go ahead and jump to steaming the, will, the milk while pulling the espresso shot. And now this entire thing takes just a little over 12 seconds. So let's remember that because we're going to try to improve this as we start to build out this coffee shop. So let's go back to our analogy here. Now let's for a moment assume that our coffee shop gets super popular and we have a huge lineup of, of people out the door waiting to get cappuccinos. And this one barista that's operating this coffee shop just simply cannot keep up with the demand. So what do we do? Well, we can hire a couple more employees, right? So let's say we go ahead and hire a cashier and another barista, and maybe our coffee shop now starts to look something like this, right? So now we have a cashier and two baristas, and just to kind of keep our, our example a little bit simple, we're going to assume that we now have two coffee grinders, and we've upgraded our espresso machine to be able to pull two espresso shots at once, and we have two steam wands. So with this new model, let's take a look at how it works. So an order arrives from a customer, the cashier takes this order, and now the cashier has this new responsibility, it has to figure out which one of these two baristas to route this order to. And what if both baristas are busy? They're busy processing or making a cappuccino. Well, in that case, this cashier should wait, not accept any more orders, and wait until one of these baristas becomes available to take that order. Now, let's assume that it's this barista that can accept the order. So we go ahead and send that over to this barista. The barista goes ahead, grinds the coffee beans, walks over to the espresso machine, pulls that espresso shot, but we notice that we can do one other thing to kind of improve this, this example here. See, the, the barista can go ahead and start steaming the milk while waiting to pull that espresso shot. And at that point, the barista will wait until both the espresso shot and the steamed milk are ready, and then combine the two ingredients and create the cappuccino. So if we, want, if we wanted to implement this now in code, how would we go about doing this? One approach is that we could use threads, and that's totally a fair approach to use. But we're going to approach this by using coroutines, right? So we can actually have the cashier and the two baristas be represented as coroutines. Let's take a look at how we would do that in code. So we're going to first start off by doing a little bit of refactoring here. Let's go ahead and take that little block, out of a block of code out and wrap it in this process orders function. And process orders is essentially what a barista is doing. And now remember, we said we have two baristas, and we want to rep re represent them as coroutines. So we'll go ahead and launch two coroutines, and inside that coroutine, we're going to call process orders. Now, we can't just quite launch a coroutine like this. See, we have to launch a coroutine from within a coroutine scope, and that's the whole notion of structured concurrency. If you, take, if you step back for a moment and think about RxJava for a second, see, whenever we would connect to an observable, or rather subscribe to an observable, we get back a subscription, and then we would place that subscription into this collection of subs subscriptions. And eventually, when the activity gets destroyed, we would clear out that subscription. Well, it's the same concept here with coroutines, except that it's naturally doing this for us implicitly by using a coroutine scope. So as long as we have that parent coroutine scope, we can actually cancel and have that cancellation propagate towards its children. So for us, we need to add one more thing here, and I'm going to use run blocking. Now, run blocking isn't something you probably want to use in production, but it could be something useful to do in your unit tests. Now, what run blocking does for us, and why we, want to, why, why we might want to use this in our uh, example here, is that it creates a main coroutine, but it also places this special constraint that it will block the main thread from terminating until all of its child coroutines have completed. Now, for us Android engineers, you know, we wouldn't want to use something like this. We might use something like a main scope and then maybe tie that to a view model. But in our case, we're going to stick with something like this. So we want to do one more thing here. And just from a debugability point of view, we're going to associate each of these coroutines with a name. So we have Brista1 and Brista2. So now our application looks something like this. Let's give it a go and see how our application performs. So ideally, what we're hoping for you know, is that 
we have both our baristas working together processing these orders. But there's a couple of problems that happen here, right? So the first thing is that the time it took is getting printed out immediately. Not quite what we're looking for. But the bigger issue here is that if you look through all this, right, it's only Barista 1 that's actually processing all these orders. And it's almost like Barista 1 is, it completes all the orders and then Barista 2 gets a chance to run. So not really ideal, definitely not what we were looking for. Let's take a look at why this is happening. So the first problem here is that when we launch this core routine, we're launching it into the main, main thread. Now that should be okay because See, coroutines, we can suspend execution and allow another coroutine to resume in that same thread. And that's really the beauty of coroutines, right? But this isn't the case here. And the reason why is if we kind of jump through process orders and we remember what we were doing with each of these functions was that we we're calling thread.sleep. And that blocks the main thread and it prevents the other coroutines from jumping in and utilizing that thread resource. So we can solve this in two ways. I mean, one really simple approach here is that let's not launch into the main thread, right? Why don't we launch our coroutines into the IO thread pool, right? So we can update this very easily by doing something like this. And if we run this, we might see a little bit of an improvement here, right? So now we can see Brista 1 and Brista 2 are processing those orders, which is good, but you know, it's not really taking advantage and really maximizing the, the power of each thread. So let's actually tackle the root cause of the problem here. So Looking at these functions, we noticed that the main issue here was because we were calling thread.sleep. What we want to do is actually use something that allows this coroutine to suspend its execution so another coroutine can take its place. And we can do that by using this delay function. See, what delay does internally is it defines this continuation point and it tells the Kotlin runtime, hey, remember where I am and come back to me after this little bit of, bit of period elapses. So we can do that, but Here's the other thing. See, delay is also a suspending function. And the contract there is that you must call another, you must call a suspending function from either another coroutine or from another suspending function. And for that reason, we go ahead and we apply the suspend modifier to each of these function calls. But because each of these function calls was also being called from process orders, we need to update that to also apply the suspend modifier. And now we have something like this. So let's give this another run. And now this is looking a lot better, right? So we have Barista1 and Barista2 both operating concurrently. They're taking turns utilizing the main thread. But we're still left with this one problem here, which is the time. It gets printed out immediately. And really, if we kind of follow through here, what's happening is that this, these two launch operations get triggered immediately. And so all we ended up doing was just measuring how long it took to launch two coroutines, right? So we can actually fix this, though. What we really want to do is have some way of suspending this block of code here so that we wait until those two child coroutines have completed and then we exit that block so we can get a full picture of how long it took to actually execute those two coroutines. And we can do that by using something called a coroutine scope and it does exactly that. See, the call will suspend right there at that coroutine scope point and it'll wait until those two child coroutines have completed execution and then it'll exit that block and now we get a better picture of how long it's taking. So back to our example here with our coroutine scope added in. And if we run this, we should now get a better picture of how long it's taking. And ideally what we're looking for here is that, remember, it took us 12 seconds before. It should take us six seconds now because we have two baristas processing these orders. But if we look at this, that's not really the case, right? It's still taking 12 seconds. And if we look a little closer, you'll notice that both of these baristas are actually processing the same set of orders twice. And this is not good because we just hired another barista and now they're duplicating orders and now our coffee shop is essentially hemorrhaging money. So we need to fix this. So how do we go about doing that? Well, what we really need to do here is have the two baristas somehow communicate with that cashier, right? And to, do, to perform communication between core teams, we can accomplish that using channels. And just for a moment, let's look back at what threads do when we had to communicate between threads. See, with, with communicating across threads, we had to share memory. With channels, though, the whole concept here is to share or to communicate between core teams using message passing, and channels are that thing that facilitates that message passing. And as long as your message is immutable, you're in good shape. So let me take a moment here to kind of go through how channels work, 
and then we'll go back into our application and see how we can leverage channels. So a channel has three components. It has a sender, a receiver, and it has this optional buffer inside of it. Now, the way it works is that if I'm the sender and I wanted to send this message, and let's assume that the receiver was maybe not there, or maybe that receiver was busy. Me, as I place that message onto that channel, I'm basically suspended. I can't do any more work. I have to wait until that receiver comes around and grabs that message. So the moment that that receiver grabs onto that message, that's the moment of synchronization. That's the moment I can let go of that message. I know the receiver has received it. I can go and start doing my work. And this receiver can receive that and start performing any operations on it. So what, what happens when we have a buffer channel? Well, it's pretty much the same thing, except that the sender doesn't block until this buffer is completely full. Now, once that buffer is full and the sender tries to send another message, it causes the sender to suspend execution. From the receiver's point of view, things are a lot simpler. See, it doesn't matter if that channel is buffered or not. The receiver is going to suspend execution as long as there is nothing on that channel. All right, let me talk about one more type of channel mode. It's called a conflated channel. And this is a lot like Rx Java's back pressure latest mode. The way it works is that, see, the sender is never going to suspend execution. And there's this buffer of size one inside there. And it has a special constraint. So the sender goes ahead, sends something onto this channel. It goes immediately into this buffer. And if that receiver is still busy, can't consume that message, the sender can still send another message, except that it overwrites the last message that was in there and places in the latest one. So when the receiver is finally ready to consume from there, it's always going to get the latest. And this is something really nice when we're developing UI applications, right? So we can do something like, we can use a conflated channel for something like maybe touch events or, or click events. All right, let's go back to our example here. And let's now leverage channels. So the first thing we're going to do is create an orders channel. So we instantiate this channel object, and then we're going to iterate through our list of orders. And for each order item, we're going to write it onto that channel. In other words, we're going to send it to the channel. And because we're now using channels, let's go ahead and update our process orders function to pass in that orders channel object. And then in our process orders function, we're now, rather than what we were doing before, which is orders dot for each, we're going to consume off of this channel by calling orders channel dot consume each. Right? And at this point, this barista will suspend execution here at this point, waiting for some order to arrive. And once it does, it'll, it'll uh, grab that message and process that order. So with this new version of our application, let's go ahead and run this. And we'll see how it's working. Now, once I run it, it's actually stuck. Right? So this is not good. See, it, it, it's basically like we printed out the orders and then it, run, it ran into an issue, and it seems like it ran into an issue right about here. Let's try to understand why this happened. So let's go back to this example here, and let's break this down piece by piece. So we know that there's some issue right around here. And if we start from the very beginning here, when I called run blocking, we went ahead and created a main coroutine, which is good. And then we created this new channel object, and then we sent something onto that channel. So the sender was the main coroutine, sent something onto that channel, and who's connected to this channel? No one, right? And what happens in this case? Well, because there's no receiver to consume from that channel, the main coroutine suspends execution. And this is the reason why our program has just deadlocked right at this point. So in order to fix this, though, we can do something like this. We can go ahead and launch a new coroutine. And this is our cashier coroutine. And now inside this coroutine, we can actually go ahead and start writing to that channel. And so when we write to that channel immediately the first time around, it'll actually suspend the cashier coroutine completely fine. But that means that the main coroutine is free to continue operating. All right, so now that we have this version, let's give it another run. And this is looking a lot better, right? And in fact, if we look right here, Barista 1 is processing an order that is $3.50. And another Barista, Barista 2, is processing a different order. So this is looking a lot better, except for one issue. Our program isn't terminating. It's stuck at the end now. So let's try to think about why this is happening. And if we go back to our coffee shop analogy, it's a lot like our cashier closed up the coffee shop, went home, and forgot to tell the two baristas that the coffee shop is closed. So how do we fix this? 
right? Let's actually, let's for a moment just take a look at this part here. The process orders piece here, right? Remember, our, our two baristas are just receiving from this channel. And we've never closed that channel. So we need to close that channel. And it's up to the sender to actually do this. So let's go ahead and add this back in here. And we'll give it another run. And now what we should end up seeing is hopefully this takes half the time that it originally was supposed to take, and that's exactly it. So we're now down to six seconds, and this is pretty good, but we can do a little bit better here. See, we're doing a bunch of boilerplate code right here. See, we don't need to create, an, uh, create a channel. We don't need to launch another coroutine and then also have to remember to close this channel. We can actually use a special type of coroutine builder that manages all of this for us. And that's the whole purpose of pr the produce coroutine builder. So we'll go ahead and add this in, and it does exactly the same thing as we were doing before. And you know, just to kind of really drill down into the details, it's a lot like this. See, the produce or the produce coroutine builder creates a coroutine, and it has a, a channel associated with it. It exposes a received channel externally, but internally it has a send channel. And so inside this coroutine, we can go ahead and process some data, and then write to that channel, and then the produce coroutine waits. For some received cor or for some other coroutine to consume from that channel, and once that happens, the coroutine is free to process the next message, and this repeats itself. So just to kind of recap where we are so far, we have something like this: we have a cashier coroutine, we have two barista coroutines, and in the middle we had this channel that allows us to communicate between the cashier to the two baristas. So the cashier goes ahead, writes an order onto that channel, and because the two baristas are available to consume messages or process orders. They receive off of that channel. And now, once these two baristas are now busy processing these orders, the cashier can't send a new order, so it suspends execution. But eventually, one of these baristas will free up, and we can write back onto that channel, and the barista will receive it, and this process repeats eventually until a point where the cashier closes the channel, and once the two baristas consume this closed channel token message, they are able to terminate their coroutines and the application stops. So to kind of recap where we are so far, what we've seen is that we can create, we can define units of work that we want to execute concurrently by using coroutines. And we've seen how we can have coroutines communicate with each other by using channels. But there's this piece in the middle that we've kind of overlooked. See, that's the espresso machine. And it's acting like this shared resource. And it's almost like a worker pool. See, but that's not really how it's being performed right now. So imagine if I, go, I went ahead and added in 10 baristas, or let's say even 100 baristas. They will all be able to pull espresso shots without any contention. So it's almost like we have this like magical infinite espresso machine. Not exactly what we're looking for, right? So let's go ahead and address this part of the problem. And we're gonna do that by first creating this new espresso machine object. And externally, from the barista's point of view, it looks a lot like what the barista was dealing with before. Same signature as before, so we still have the pull espresso shot and still have the steam milk function. And internally, the same dynamics still apply. We, we still, it still takes 600 milliseconds to process an espresso shot, and it still takes 300 milliseconds to process steaming the milk. So we can kind of forget about that part, but the thing that we're really interested in figuring out is how do we limit the number of baristas actually pulling an espresso shot? Right? So it's really up to the espresso machine to figure that part out. And it, it's up to the espresso machine to figure out which one of the two porta filters to route a request to. So to look at this in a more conceptual manner, we're trying to build something like this. We have the barista, has the ground beans, and it needs to go ahead and send it to the espresso machine. The espresso machine is the piece here in the middle that is responsible for figuring out which one of these two porta filters to route that request to. But if both of them are in use, then the espresso machine should suspend execution, which in turn suspends the barista's execution. So let's break this down piece by piece, and we'll start to implement this. Now, the porta filter is the actual thing that's doing the work, right? It's basically the workhorse here. And the porta filter's job is to take those ground beans as an input and extract the espresso out of it, right? So we can actually, for, for when we're dealing with trying to define some unit of work, we can define that using a coroutine, right? So we can represent these two porta filters as coroutines. Now, how do we communicate with coroutines? That's right, using channels. So we can go ahead and represent these two parts as channels. And now if we go ahead and just focus in on how to create this porta filter, well, what we can do is create a channel 
and create a core team, but we don't necessarily have to do that. See, if we think back to what we did with the produce core team builder, that was basically creating a core team, and inside there, it was generating some event or, or some object, and then writing it off to the channel. What we need to do is the exact opposite, right? We need some channel that we can write to and have this core team consume from that channel. And we can do that by using this actor core team builder. And it does pretty much that. It has a send channel that it exposes, which we can go ahead and pass the ground beans into. And this actor core team, or basically that port of filter, will, will receive from that channel, process that, and then eventually emit the result, right? And this process can repeat as well. So let's go ahead and update our espresso machine to take advantage of this. So the first thing we'll do is go ahead and create an actor using the actor core team builder. And then remember, it has a receive channel inside of it, and that means that we can receive something off of it. We take the ground beans, we pass it into the espresso shot rec um, function, which pulls the espresso shot. And remember, this is all inside a core team, so this is totally fine. And then finally, what we need to do is um, figure out a way to communicate this result back out to the caller. Now, because we have two port of filters, We'll go ahead and just duplicate this just to kind of keep our example simple here. So here's what we have so far. We figured out the part on how to pull the espresso shot and represent it using our core team and a channel. What we need to do is figure out how we can select between these two different channels, whichever one is available to send to. So what we're really trying to do is use this select keyword, right? And we can do that. Um, so what is the select keyword? So select works a lot like a switch statement, but it's for our channels. And it works on send and receive. And really what it's doing is it's allowing us to shape our data flow. In, in this case here, what we have is a fan out, right? So we're trying to figure out how to, whichever channel is first available to send to and send to that one. But we can do something like a fan in where we can have multiple receive channels and we can select from the first channel that, we, that has data available on it. Or we can do a combination of the two, like a fan out and a fan in which is like a turnout. But let's go back to our example and now apply uh, or update our process espresso shot function to apply this select statement. So over here, we go ahead and we create the select statement and inside there we have the two channels and we're just calling dot on send on there. And just for a moment, let's assume that both port of filters are in use, right? So now when a call comes in and we hit the select statement, that's where we suspend execution. But let's assume that port of filter one is available to send to. So in this point here, we're able to send the ground beans directly to this port of filter. And over here, now that we know that it went to port of filter one, we just need to figure out how to get the result back from that port of filter. So that's the next step, right? So just to quickly recap, here's where we're at, right? We figured out how to, how to have the barista route or send something into the espresso machine and then have the espresso machine route it to the first available port of filter and the port of filter to actually process but what we need to do is figure out how to get the result back out to the barista. So let's go back here. And it's almost like what, what we need here is a callback. But we don't want to use callbacks exactly the way that callbacks are used traditionally because, see, it's not really leveraging the whole use of coroutine. See, what we want the coroutine to do is suspend execution while it's waiting for this result to come back. And we can do that by using something called a completable deferred. But to get to that point, we need to make a little bit of a change. So we're going to introduce this new object called an espresso shot request. And inside there, we're going to have the completable deferred and also the ground beans. And that's the thing that we're now going to start sending to our port of filters. So we'll update our port of filter to now consume a espresso shot request. And then from there, We'll be able to extract the ground beans, pass it back into the process espresso shot function. We get the espresso, and then here's where the magic happens. We use that completable deferred, and we call dot complete. And this is the thing that will then signal the caller to say, here's the result you are waiting for. Now let's connect the dots. Let's go back to the caller side and see how we can use this. So the first thing we're going to do is create this request object. We're then going to pass it into the port filter, and then over here, we're going to use that completable deferred and call dot await. And this is going to call, this is going to force the, the core team to suspend its execution here and wait for that result to come back. And once it does, we're able to communicate back to the barista, here's the espresso shot. All right, we're not done quite yet. So we have to do one more thing. And remember, actors are building out a core team internally. And so that means that we need to have our espresso machine 
implement a quarantine scope. And we'll do that by using class delegation. All right, so let's go ahead and wire this all up. So we'll go ahead and create this espresso machine and then we'll pass it into the process orders function. And then finally, we'll update the process orders function to take advantage of that uh, new espresso machine. And still, you know, structurally, it's all the same. We're just gonna call pull espresso shot and steam milk. But now we're actually using this shared resource. So if we go ahead and run this, what we'll see is, you know, structurally, things are going to look and perform pretty much the same way. But the main thing here is that we now have something that is truly a shared resource. So if I were to go ahead and add in a third barista, see that third barista shouldn't be able to pull an espresso shot until the other two baristas have completed the order or completed using the, the porter filters. And so you'll notice here that we're processing porter filter on porter filter one and that's barista one. And then here's barista two. And then finally, once Porta Filter 1 becomes available, that's when Barista 3 is able to leverage that same Porta Filter. So this is looking a lot better, right? Now that we have something that's truly a shared resource, this is pretty good. Let me go ahead and remove that because that was strictly for demonstration purposes. Now, we, we said that we would do one more thing, and that's that while our Barista is going ahead and and pulling an espresso shot, we also said that the barista can be able to steam the milk at the same time. So let's go ahead and do that. And we'll do that by using this async operator. And what async does is it goes ahead and launches a coroutine, but it also gives us a handle on how to get the result back out. So these two functions here will get fired immediately. And so we're now actually steaming the milk in process or pulling an espresso shot, but we want to get the result back out. And so over here is where we're going to call deferred on those two, or call dot await on those two deferred objects. And right here is where the call is going to suspend and wait until both of them come back. And we send those two objects back into the make cappuccino function. So this is a lot like a merge operation. And you can see like structurally, it looks a lot like what we had before. So it looks like it's, it's very easy to reason about. Now we have to do one more thing and we need to wrap that with a coroutine scope. And that's because we went ahead and created two new uh, coroutines. We launched two new coroutines by using the async operators. So let's run this one more time and we should see a little bit of a performance boost. And as this is running, we'll, we'll notice that we're now down to just a little over five seconds. So this is looking pretty good. Now, the last thing I want to really quickly touch on is this new API called Flow. So Flow is something that just recently got re released into Kotlin Core Teams version 1.2. It's currently in preview mode, and it allows us to accomplish some things that you know, channels didn't allow us to get initially. See, channels are a lot like hot streams, right? So in other words, if I had a channel that was emitting events, and eventually if I connected to that channel, I might have missed some of the events that got emitted previously. On the other hand, flows are a lot like cold streams, and they basically define some template of work that we want to execute, and, we'll, and that gets executed every time we call activate on that flow. Or sorry, every time we call collect to activate that flow. So let's go ahead and update our example here to now leverage flows. So the first thing that we're going to notice here was that you know, we were using this orders channel, and in order to send to that channel, we had to go ahead and kick off a new coroutine, and that coroutine had to write to that channel even though nothing was connected to it. So we're eagerly trying to send stuff onto that channel. We can actually go ahead and change that by using a flow. And we can do that very easily by using this extension function on a list, which is called dot as flow. So it converts this orders list into an orders flow. And the next thing we want to do is update this block of code here where we were launching the two coroutines which are the two baristas that were processing the orders. And the main thing is that we really want to tackle that process orders function. So initially, that process orders function was taking in a receive channel and consuming off of that. But instead, what we're going to do is take in a flow. And rather than consuming off of this, we, we can't actually use that. We're going to actually change that to transform the output of what was there into something else. So we're going to use the map operator to transform it to return back a cappuccino object, right? Which means that now this flow of orders is now being transformed into a flow of cappuccino objects. So if we go back here, we can actually change this 
part here to now leverage flows. So what we do is we use this flow builder called flow of, which takes in a list of arguments, in other words, a list of objects, and in our case, we're passing it in to flows which are emitting cappuccino objects. And what we really have now is a flow of flows. And the next thing what we need to do is we actually gotta convert that flow of flows back into a single flow stream, right? And we'll use that, we'll do that by using flat and merge. And so it's basically concurrently allowing the two baristas to still process those orders, convert it back into a single stream. And then finally, we'll activate this stream by calling collect and then emitting, capturing this cappuccino object and logging it to the console. So let's go ahead and run this final version. And so far things are looking good, except for one thing. So we've kind of regressed a bit. See, the two baristas are once again starting to process the exact same set of orders. And we've, we solved this problem last time, but the, the issue this time around is different. See, both of those baristas, when they connect to that original orders flow, that orders flow is a cold stream. And so every time you connect to this, this cold stream, you're actually activating a brand new stream. So both of them are actually using two separate streams of orders. What we want the two baristas to do is actually share the same stream. So we can actually modify this a bit to do just that. And we're going to do that by first converting that orders flow back into a hot stream, which is calling by doing produce in, which converts this into a receive channel. Now we can't use a receive channel as is, we actually still want to use a flow. So we're gonna actually convert that receive channel back out to a flow. And we're gonna do that by calling as flow, but we're gonna write this handy extension function on receive channel. And we're gonna do that by using this flow builder. And then inside there, we're going to consume every element off the receive channel, and then finally emit it back onto the flow. So now that we have this, which is a shared stream between the two baristas, let's give it another run and see how it's performing. So things are looking a lot better, and from a performance point of view, it's behaving pretty much just as we had before, but now we're using cold streams. So we started off with something like this, where we had a, a coffee shop that was very simple, right? It was just one barista, and all our code was very sequential, it was very easy to reason about. And we, find, we eventually migrated it, or rather evolved it, into something more complex like this, where we had multiple baristas, and we had a cashier, and we had this shared resource. But the way that we got to this point was we took that initial sequential bit of code, and we broke it down into smaller sequential subprocesses. And we had them communicating with each other by using coroutines and channels. And really, if you think about it, this is the whole philosophy around communicating sequential processes. And so with that, I want to thank you all for coming out and listening to my talk on coroutines and channels. Um, I'll be around afterwards to take any questions, but uh, thank you all. <laughs>